Sick Harrison Price from the Historic Wall Center. This next interview brought to you by the Vancouver Canadians. Thanking Seas fans for another unbelievable season at the Nat this year. If you're looking to guarantee your seat for all the 2025 action, and there'll be some upgrades to the ballpark, yeah. should look fantastic. Please visit CanadiansBaseball.com or call 604-872-5232. Joining us now, former Vancouver Canuck and TSN hockey analyst, Mr. Frank Corrado. How are you? Let me ask you something. Mm. How dare they? How dare they? Who? Blue Jays? Put Phil DiGiuseppe on waiver. Oh, oh your boy. No one oh, does yeah. that to my boy. There was, there was How a dare they? And, and there... early, too, Frank. That's yeah, the... that's a sneaky, sneaky little maneuver. That's yeah. a nice way of saying, we need you. Yes. But we have to do a little roster configuration to make sure we can keep you in the fold. So we'll send you down early before no one, like no one else, is making waiver claims right now. They're all filtering through their stuff. But yeah. there was actually reports that he might get claimed. Columbus had yeah, shown like some Columbus interest. Took a look, but yeah. <laughs> so well. Well, and the other thing, um, the other thing um, um, uh, about that as well is, uh, uh, you know, talk it. When talk had talked, he said, Frankie, that was a tough one. You can tell he really likes him some Phil Deej. I saw or Deej, I saw as he called him. I, I, what did he call him? Deej. 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 P D G. Deej. Um, I saw talk it. One of his quotes was like, We really hope he clears. Like, I hope yeah, he doesn't yeah. get claimed. Yeah. That's a little better than what Willie said to me when he put me on waivers when he flat out said, I hope you get claimed because there'll be a better opportunity for you somewhere else. Oh, <laughs> no. <laughs> he did not. Yeah. I, ain't, I ain't never going to play you, kid. So. Hope oh you get claimed God. out there, pal. <laughs> oh my god well you know we we've told your well, story but you did and it was not a better it was not better it was not any better <laughs> we've told your story i think we told it last week you thought willie desjardins was the boogeyman when really you were about to meet him and his name oh, was bad talk it's a bad bad track record with the mm -hmm. province of saskatchewan at that point in my career <laughs> so we told your story last week again and it's it's a good one um and now it, it has us thinking about you a little bit or people in your situation, because, you know, when Bull Horvat or Jake for or McCann or even Besser was trying to make this team, uh, wasn't a very good team. And they were first round picks like recent first round picks. And so a little bit more understandable for a team to keep them late and give them a legit shot to make the team. Um, as we look now at guys like Ratu and Baines, I mean, certainly for Baines, his uh, shiny new toy uh, status is long past. And even Ratu, uh, despite being 21, same thing. Not their draft pick and has sort of been in a tough spot for the last 18 months in terms of the organization. So the fact that they've made it this deep, are they starting to convince themselves, not that they're not that they're taking it for granted but are they starting to think i've got a real shot here do they have a real shot here or are they going to get carotted and play in the final preseason game and feel all good about themselves only to be told you're going back kid i i mean listen it's i think both avenues are, are somewhat realistic but for for a guy like like ratu whose job are you taking like he he looks good and i think you know, the one game against Edmonton, I'm now what happens is when you play well early in the preseason, everyone's watching you even closer because they're like, this guy showed us something. So now we got to watch him and actually see if he's for real. Mm -hmm. And I thought the energy dropped a little bit in that game. I believe it was, was it in Edmonton? Um, yes, Edmonton. Yeah, the, the game in Edmonton. Monday, like, Monday. You're like the energy can't drop now. You got to ride that wave a little bit more because now all eyes are on you because you've earned that. You've earned all eyes being on you. And so the conversation goes from do you put yourself in a position where all eyes are on you to taking someone's job? And at the same time, if you're trying to take someone's job, how's that guy played? Because chances are that guy has played pretty well as well because he doesn't want to lose his job. So I think there's like it's almost like a perfect storm that needs to happen for guys like that, where you're right, Blake. It's not like, it's not like they, they went into camp saying these guys could be penciled in. Like you're really trying to turn some heads. I feel like it's, it's a long process. And um, you know, they're for, for Baines, like at the end of the day, both those guys, 
if they can leave camp and say, I checked off all the boxes that I needed to check off, and I basically did everything I could do, I just couldn't make the team. I couldn't take someone's job. You can live with that. And that happens all the time. And chances are there's going to be injuries at some point and you're playing the long game and you're going to get called up and that'll be another opportunity for you. But it's it's if you're not the first round pick, if you're not their shiny toy, like you really have to like it has to be overwhelming. And yeah. that also has to coincide with someone not playing well, which is also a Corrado when that training camp, that last training camp I had in Vancouver, I will fully admit, uh, not my best work on the ice. So probably warranted being on waivers if you just went by my play at the time. Just to make things clear. Just to clear you, the You air. can also get salary cap well, too, which is which is so, difficult. So a uh, few things here. Number one, there's an expression in boxing. You, you're not going to beat the champ on points. you got to knock the champ out. And I think that applies here when talking about established guys or higher pedigreed guys. We're trying to make a roster. Secondly, how do you feel about him turning your last name into a verb? Corrado. Yeah. I mean, it's fair. It's fair. <laughs> like this, the Sicaris is a hole in one. The price oh, is, wow. you know, I, I don't know what the, the price is. We'll, we'll work on that. We'll, we'll find something this yeah. year. Yeah. Daily, yeah. Better get what it, how, how, daily disappointment. How does, how does big Sal feel about his name? Being used yeah. as a verb? It's all in good fun. Mm. So here's the other. Uh, so here's the other thing, though, fellas. Uh, we learned that Dakota Joshua will be joining the club on the first trip, which means Dakota Joshua is going to miss the first six games. Uh, Bluger yesterday uh, and has continuously said he'll be ready for the opener. When asked if he's going to play in the final preseason game yesterday, he said, "Oh, we'll see. It's kind of a collective decision." So there very well could be a world where Baines, Oman, and Ratu all make this team mm -hmm. for the start of the season. But you've got to be cap compliant. Well, too, so. and then there's the other side where um, if Bluger's back and they keep 21 because they start at home and because, you know, cap-wise, they can accrue a little bit of cap space, it, it may well be coming down to a battle of, you know, one spot, and they're not even going to carry an extra forward until they go out. Right on the road. So there's that's all tough. different sort of, yeah. And that's what I was going to ask you, Frank. That's tough. Um, I've, I've tell seen me that about a lot the pressure. Now. Yeah. Tell me about the pressure. Tell me about what it's like emotionally, psychologically, when you're in that mix and you know, you were subject to all these different matriculations, some of which you have zero control over. Okay. So like, first of all, from the, the player's point of view, I think you account for, you know, if you're a bubble guy, like I was, you're kind of accounting for a 23 man roster. You're like, I just want to be around. I just want to stick around and show that I could be, you know, I'm the guy you see at practice working really hard. I'm the guy you see, you know, staying on the ice or going on the ice before. So when the time comes, you're not looking at Abbotsford and asking, Who's playing well down there? Like, I'm right here and you've seen me the whole time. So, you know, you want to keep yourself in the mix because sometimes um, it is a little bit of a case of out of sight, out of mind. You can go down to the minors and, you know, they're going to get the reports. But at the end of the day, there's nothing better than having the eyes that are actually making the decisions on you. And that being Rick Tockett and his coaching staff. Um, so w if they're going to do a 21 man roster, now that's two guys that were maybe thinking I had a chance to kind of sneak on and hang around and maybe get a shot. Now you're making different plans. So that's tough from the player's point of view, from the team's point of view. Um, I, I saw this. Um, I saw this with Toronto a couple years back. They were so capped out that they had to do basically a 20 man. Like they had no healthy scratches and the the lines literally did not change for the first week and a half, two weeks of the season. So then you're starting to talk about, OK, well, if they lost game two going to game three, how different is it going to look? It's not like it's just you're stuck and you're waiting for injuries. And like, I think for the coach, that kind of stifles what you can do with your lineup as well. Now, all of a sudden, you don't have the creativity to say, okay, I'm going to mix things up. I'm going to bring Oman in one night, or I'm going to put Hoaglander maybe on this line. It's like, you're, you're just, you're confined to what you have. So, um, you know, from the player's point of view, from the coach's point of view, it's just, it's nice if you can have at least two extra guys, it just helps you, you know, for, for, for players, there's a couple guys that can hang around a little more. And for the coach, you don't feel so stifled 
um, that just that's who you got and there's nothing else you can do about it. For a contending team, though, when you've got your AHL team in the back pocket down the road, uh, I mean, as long as you've got two way guys, a waiver exempt guys, that is that you can go up, uh, bring up and down. I mean, if you can have a day where you're below LTIR and accruing space, don't you owe it to yourself to do that for, for down the road? Don't you? Owe, I mean, it, it, it's, it kind of wreaks havoc with that young player who's waiver exempt, but maybe that's just the way that maybe that's the modern game right now. If you've got the AHL team close is play with 20 guys for your homestand for your four games and, and yeah. stay below yeah. the cap. Waiver exempt guy is going to hate it because he's likely still on a two way and mm-hmm. he's going down and he's making, you know, not to, 75 not K, to bitch yes. about. Yeah. Like, yeah. listen, it's, it's good money. Like, you know, there's worse problems you can have in the world, but you know, you're making 80 grand in the American league, which is, you know, good money. Uh, but you're also in the NHL making uh, 700 to 800, maybe 900,000. So it is, mm-hmm. you know, it's quite a difference. And um, ultimately, as a player, you're not so focused on the here and now of the financials. You're hoping that you can stick in the NHL and sign another deal and a deal after that, that, you know, you don't, you don't even think about that anymore. Um, But you're right. I mean, the thing about having the team close, it does give you some advantage in that way. But I'll tell you what, man, like when I played in Utica, I would get a call on Friday night that someone got hurt in the game and I was there for Saturday. Like you can make it, you know what I mean? Like you could make it work. And that was halfway, like that was all the way across the continent. And I still could get there in one day's notice. You know, now that it's in Abbotsford, you're just, you're 45 minutes away. Uh, But the game is not, you know, like unless someone rolls an ankle walking to and from the rink, I don't, I don't see a situation where like in that regard, it's, it's such a big difference because if you could get there in one day uh, across the continent, it's, I don't know, like it, we've kind of seen it done at that point. I want to say it was a prospect with Anaheim a few years ago. Uh, of course, they're in San Diego, and apparently he was up and down like nine or ten times mm-hmm. during the course of a season. Um, yeah, I, look, uh, I hear you, Frank. We'll, we'll see if there is any uh, uh, salary cap accruing going on here with the Vancouver Canucks. I want to ask you about Hoaglander because it's two straight coaches here, Boudreau and then Talkit, that have talked about him needing to be better defensively. Everybody loves him in the half court. Like when you have the puck in the offensive zone, he is a dog on the bone and everybody likes it and it likes him in 24 goals. But um, it looks like Daniel Sprong is going to get first crack to play with Pedersen and DeBrusque. They went out and signed all these wingers in free agency, which I think was a little bit of a tell. And we know they absolutely need to improve the defense, uh, particularly second pair right side, if not third pair left side as well. What do you think? What's your forecast for Hoaglander this season? And, and do you view him as expendable to try and get one of those defensemen? There, there are six inches that matter the most to Hoaglander. And it's not on the ice. It's literally right here. It's the toolbox because the player has all these tools. He can fly around the ice. He's got some grit to his game. He's got fantastic hands. He's got a good shot that we saw last year. If you watched him play in his time prior to coming over in the SHL, you really got to see the skill with the lacrosse goals and all that stuff like that. He's he's got no shortage of tools. It's all right here where I don't think he thinks the game necessarily the way a coach would want him to. Um, and, and so that's his issue. And now there's been a couple coaches that have kind of pointed that out. And at some point for him, it was probably going to have to go from you're a young guy, you're trying to figure things, figure things out, but now you're, you're starting to get it and you found it. And like, I think there's been signs of that, but there probably is still a little to be desired in that department. I just think he he can think the game better. He can think the game smarter. And he's probably never been wired to do that because he's been so skilled. And and now we're kind of seeing like the NHL, um, you know, it's it can be a games can be a little bit of a chess match in the NHL. And you have to be equipped for that. And and not every shift, um, not every shift requires everything. You know, there's going to be some shifts where it's like it, it's there, there's just going to be non 
exciting play that happens. It's just going to be a neutral zone kind of mucky shift where you punt it, they punt it, you punt it, you get off the ice. That happens in the NHL. Sometimes you can't force the issue. And I think sometimes he gets caught in that. Um, but I think, you know, if, if you want to talk about him being expendable, there's a team out there that would probably like to have his skill set and will continue the conversation saying, if we can just get that six inches between the ears to think a little bit better, oh, yeah. we might have something. And, and that, like, he, he will have the benefit of the doubt in that regard because I do think he's a very skilled player. When you have talent, there is always a coach out there who says, let me have him, you know, yeah. let me see if I, if I can work with him. Uh, the big debate Blake and I have been having, although he's come to my side on this. Uh, do you play Susie with Myers and then have Forbert and DeHarnay play limited minutes as a third pair? Do you spread that out where you've got Myers with Forbert? And what's, what's your take on this? With Susie, I'm spread it out. What have I ever been loaded up? Well, you were last week when you were really? making the analogy with you made an analogy, Frank, that you've got a tiny slab of butter and you got two big pieces of toast. Mm -hmm. Do you take that slab of butter and butter one piece of toast and make it Yummy. pretty close yeah. to you know a regular piece of butter toast with one dry, or, or do you try and parcel out that butter? Wow, pieces of toast that's the price right there. There it is. Um, Making breakfast toast. Metaphors. Yeah, that's my thing. I guess. I guess you're asking. You're you, at that point. You're asking: Is Vinny DeHarnay a top four defenseman? To some on, degree, on a day yes. to day. Like yes, that's sure. that's the crux of of what you're asking. And I think if, if you've watched him in Edmonton, um, in in a pinch hit situation, playing in the top four, he's handled it well at times. But eventually, I feel like he kind of filtered his way back down to that third pair. And that just felt like a nice spot for him where the ice time and who he was on the ice against, everything just seemed to fit right. I thought Tyler Myers had a really good season last year. And when I watch Carson Soucy play, I see a guy that makes good decisions for the most part, is better uh, with the puck than some might make him out to be. Um, so I don't like I, I don't have an issue with Myers and Susie playing together, and I don't have an issue with DeHarnay being a third pair defenseman. And, you know, the ice time is probably going to reflect how you feel or how the coach feels about DeHarnay and Forbert as a third pair. Can they play 15 minutes together in the NHL? That's basically a regular shift without, you know, special teams. And maybe let's say they kill a little bit here That's and there. The thing. They can kill. I yeah. have no doubt. I have no doubt. I think 15 minutes, a regular shift. I mean, that's very much within grasp for both those guys where I, I don't feel like they would be uh, liabilities. And then, you know, you also have to keep in mind, Quinn Hughes loves playing with Philip Peronic. Yeah. Like he's talked about that already this year, how much he likes playing with Philip Peronic. So if my star defenseman, who's one of the best, let's call it three defensemen, in the NHL wants to play with someone because he thinks that's better for his game. Um, he can play with that guy and we'll figure the rest out underneath that. I think we're in a, a modern See, zone of coaching here too, where like, you know, the, a third line, what is a third line? Does a third line actually even play that much more than a fourth line these days? They're just different than the fourth line. I think in a lot of cases, heck last year, there was times where the third line played well, more than the second line at five on five. It depends on your talent. And it, it depends it, who your coach is. Like, there's well, still some but, coaches that will yeah. play the fourth line seven and a half minutes. Right. And, and so with that in mind, to your point, do you just keep Ronick and Hughes pretty much away from the kill? And that reduces how much you need to guard against them five on five because forward and DRNA, if they are a pair, they'll rarely go out at five on five. They'll go out for every kill. And maybe that's where they eat up their time. You're asking them to play for 12 to 15 minutes a game. Maybe you can get by with a handful of five on five shifts because Ronick and Hughes are eating up well, so much time. Well, you, you know, what's going to happen too? like the, the season is going to start. And I feel like we've had the same conversation the last few years. Man, scoring is up is in the NHL. And how about these crazy fluctuations in the game where it's like this team came back from two down. These guys came back from three down. You know why? Because everyone's tinkering with their lineups and everyone <laughs> thinks they have the answer right now. And they're going to see by like, I don't know, people say U.S. Thanksgiving, Christmas, the New Year, whatever, whatever your your kind of time frame is. But at some point, 
they will have, you know, the the correct structure of how their roster breaks out. But we're probably going to see it for more than a few games. And I think my my stance on that third pair is that I don't see it being an issue to the point where it's like you have to get those guys off the ice because they can't go on together anymore. I just I, I don't see yeah. them being that bad. I think I think, dude, if I could play 15 minutes in the NHL, those guys can play 15 minutes in the NHL every single night. You know what, Frank? You've changed my mind. You've brought me over to your side. I now stand in opposition to you. Okay. Well, and, put it uh, to you this way. If they can't that, play 15 minutes, what the hell are you paying them for? No, very, very fair. Very fair. Hey, on the tinkering. Like less than 15 minutes a night for a defenseman is like less than seven minutes a night for a forward. Yeah. Right? No, like, no. If, you, it, you like know, if you're a defenseman in the NHL and you have to play 12 minutes because you can't play anymore, you, you should be in the American League. That's right. Speaking of tinkering, um, if they reduce the preseason down to two games, can you imagine what goal scoring will look like in October as teams are still figuring things out? That'll be fun. Yeah. Like October, well, I think, is already fun, but it'll be well, extra fun. We'll also have all the skilled players available to score all the goals, so that'd be is great. That too? That's That'd be good, too. Yeah. And incidentally, next time you refer to Quinn Hughes on this program, one of the two best defensemen in the league. Not three. That's fair. I had him. We're, we're not um, abiding Adam Fox and some of these others. It is McCarr. <laughs> it is Hughes. We will take no further. Slander. I full disclosure uh, on my TSN top fifty. I still had McCarr as the top defenseman, yeah. but I did have Quinn Hughes as the second. Yeah, and, and that's Adam that's Fox. fair. And that's fair. Like McCarr has got a longer track record of playing at that yeah. level. Yeah, um, sure. we'll see what this season brings. We'll see if uh, Quinn closes the gap even even further coming off the Norris and, and can repeat. Uh, you're marvelous. Thanks, Frank. Till next See week. You boys. Thanks.